And so now our next speaker is Professor Halina Katolik. Um, perhaps, Martin, if you would put her on the screen beside me. Hello. Good morning, Helena. How very good to see you. We are so pleased that you are speaking yeah. at our symposium. Thank you very much. I will just introduce you and then invite you to speak. So Helena is Professor of the Department of Practical Psychology at the Institute of Management, Psychology and Security at the Lviv State University and she's head of the Ukrainian Institute of Child and Youth Psychotherapy and Psychological Counseling. And she has an important role in the Ukrainian Umbrella Association for Psychotherapy. She's head of their section for child and youth psychotherapy. And today she is going to speak to us about war and children, the view of a Ukrainian child psychotherapist. Helena, we look forward very much to what you have to say to us. My dear colleagues, I am so happy for being invited here. I am pleased that today I will have my speech, and especially after Vera, uh, the, a person from who I was studying and who gave me all her knowledge is the one I can use in my work and to transmit them to another psychotherapist who work with children. And now I would like to ask you, Martin, to switch on a video. And I would like to start with this video precisely. Літаю до неба рядками дитячі листи журавлі і чути молитву мами про мир на своїй землі і в золоті ниви колосся, а світу німі візла, і діти раптом стали дорослі, до нас увірвалась війна на потрібне. Кожен герой він не боїм, він батько, він сину під тьмі, не знає він сну і спокою, і ви запитання ні мі, а скільки коштують сльози, чи знаєш ціну життя, чи є та причина заради якої не стане у мами дитя, дай руку. Yeah. 
And I would like kind of to read to, to 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 express my gratitude to you, but I would like to say that on the background there was a child singing, and uh, it's really my heart bleeds every time I see this video. It's it's not possible to to watch it without any crying your eyes your eyes out, and uh, our patients, our clients, among among them, there are people who you saw on this video, the ones who survived, the ones who were raped the ones who saw a death of their own parents, of their own sisters, brothers. And it's it's really hard to talk about these things because two years of this work, I will I will show you a little bit what Ukraine is dealing with. And because perhaps the world doesn't know uh, to the end what is going on here. It, but it might be my fantasy, but I, ha I want you to know what we are working with and all villages in all regions in all cities of Ukraine with all with what kind of disorders that appeared completely new ones that none of the classification of disorders has these are the disorders uh, that have directly anything to do with war and children disorders that have to do with war now I would like kindly ask to switch my presentation on on the monitor just give me a second and the first Thing I will start with is the state of childhood as it right now on 2024. My report, all in all, is a report over the child therapy during two war, two years of war, and this is a report and gained that assembled our new experiences within the work of hundreds and even millions of children who are IDPs right now, who are in Ukraine right now, who are abroad from Ukraine spread all over the countries in Europe with who our psychotherapists are working with. The ones who also moved out from Ukraine to another countries simply while escaping from death, from horrible deaths, from those sufferings and suffering deaths. And we are united all the psychotherapists of Ukraine who work in, uh, I mean, children psychotherapists who work in different countries. And uh, weekly we provide uh, weekly supervisions uh, for our psychotherapists in Europe. These are the whole groups of psychotherapists united in, in, um, in, the, in the groups. And this is a mirroring of how children go through immigration in each country of EU, what is the state of motherhood in each country of EU among those Ukrainians who move there or while escaping from war and who move their children outside of Ukraine to save them. And I will try to touch in my report a little bit about what we are working with and what the consequences will be there. And it's really hard for me to say about the consequences. Before that, I would like to say a couple of words because that I'm from Galicia region, that is the western part of Ukraine. Back in its time, it was a part of Austro-Hungarian Empire. My father was born in 1914, uh, when the First World War started. And uh, when he was about to die, only then he told me that uh, their house was destroyed, his house was at war, his mother was with three child, little children walking around and asking for a piece of bread to feed the children. And he had a disease, a disease of uh, basically starving child. When from hunger, literally, uh, stomach is basically puffing and fluffing, and uh, the symptoms that some kind of liquid starts to, to, to pour from lips. That's the symptom of the war, and that's what my father went through. I have never understood when, every time by coming at work, he was bringing two pieces of bread. And this is something he told me when he was about to disease. And uh, only back then I understood why it is so important to have some kind of extra bread in a house. And my mother, when he, when she went through, when she lived through the Second World War, she said that her neighbors were Jewish, and her children and their children were playing together. And when 1941 started, the Jews were taken to Lviv ghetto. It was an extremely big one. And once at night, somebody knocked in her do in their doors. They opened up the doors, and there was a naked boy standing who was 14 years old, completely naked who together with his uh, parents was taken for execution in uh, Lviv, in, in the Nyanev cemetery. Up to these days, we have Jewish cemetery over there. And what he, what this boy... Okay, any, any troubles with the sound or connection? 
And I will proceed. And and he simply crawled out of that trench where he and his parents were executed because his parents basically covered his body with their bodies. And uh, my grandfather was covering him for several days in a row. And then he moved this boy to one of the churches in Lviv where a shelter, unannounced shelter was. We had um, one church activist who was basically giving shelter to people. And my mom told that when she was going from, from school, and uh, there was a, 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 a tramp, tramp going to Yanev Cemetery, and every day people could see a platform without any borders that was attached to, to a tram, and where naked people were standing, and they basically were holding to each other, and they were brought over there for execution. And people saw this every day, and the, for the rest of her life, for the, for the rest of my mother's life, she was telling these stories many and many times, because she couldn't just live with that big pain of that childhood she went through during the Second World War times. And if we think that it is will be so easy to, to us to help our kids to work with their sufferings, perhaps this is something that will live with them all their, all their lives. The question is how they're going to reimburse it. And by now we have official numbers. And I would like to mention official numbers, because that in Ukraine, 593 kids died and approximately 2,000 are wounded. And I saw, I, I see these children every day in our town. These are the children who are on, on a wheelchair without legs, without hands. They are here in Lviv, and so there is no active combat going on here. But they are here in our hospital. They are living in this very city. And this is indeed a, such a huge suffering and pain with which we will be living for many decades ahead. And how to survive with this pain, pain we have all have gone through. Because us as a psychotherapist, we are also in that very situation. We are not just outside of it. We are living through this every day, caring for our kids, caring for our families. Because literally a couple of days ago, another rocket landed in Lviv, another missile landed. And I cannot say exactly what happened, but a huge tra tragedy happened. But we have information about this one. It's, it's not that widely spread, but we know about it, and we are working with it. And yes, children are brought to us, who are not just our ki children, children, but as these are the children of IDPs from East, and we have to find a resource inside us to give resource to them and to heal them every day. I will be talking in brief about each of the topics, so I kindly ask you to look at this picture. This is another challenge that occurred. So the air alarm in Lviv, they, they are here in Lviv, and almost every day we are going down to the shelters. Every day we are going down to, to hide. When I am about to deliver my lectures we and we the sirens go on, we go to the shelter all together. Last year, we were taking exams in the shelter. That's not experience of our life. We will be dealing with in different ways, in a way we can. And now I'd like to list you seven generally accepted military uh, crimes that have to do with children who have suffered through those, through those law war law disobeying. And uh, we have our own successful sessions with our, and not only, not, not all the sessions are successful. And we would like to share it with you. The first one is that we have children who were sized and captured and who were used as a basically a shield during wartime. I would like to simply re write to you a quoted quote of a president of another state that back in its time said, let somebody from military try to shoot at their own people behind who we will be standing. Not just in front of, of them, but behind them. And let them try to shoot at women and children. And I will take a look at how, at, at, the, at the person who will give this very order in Ukraine. And these children were also brought to us. Next category of children we are working with is the following. Sexual exploitation of children. We have numerous events, numerous children who were numerously uh, raped, went through tortures. Say in Kherson, there was a torturing place where 14 years old boy was tortured. 
with the involvement of another side uh, tools like uh, glass, nails, scissors, and other and other at hand materials. I will I will simply write you the description that was published in press in one of our by one of our volunteers who was there in Poland and uh, moved and uh, delivered humanitarian help to children brought to one of the Polish clinics from here, from Ukraine. And that's what she writes. Uh, recently, we brought a help to Polish children uh, hospital where our Ukrainian uh, children from Kowal were. And they were brought to Kowal from Bucha. And they all were up to 14 years old, boys and girls. Somebody was from family, somebody was alone, without teeth because they were taken out. The the body was completely tortured. So the genitals were completely sewed with needles as a result of a rape. They do not talk. They are completely numb. That's a result of psychotrauma. The psychologists cannot even talk to them because they keep in silence all the time. And they are by now only 14 years old and they are already keeping silence. So a 65 years old Polish doctor stepped out from the room and said that I have never seen anything like this before. And to a question of a witness, could people do this? He answers, yes, they could, but they were supposed to be under some kind of drug addiction or drug influence and impact. But simultaneously, there couldn't be 1,000 of uh, pedophiles and rapists be assembled in one place. And it just happened this way that they happened to be in one place under Kyiv. How did it happen? The third category of children we are dealing with is the one involved in combat warfare. And by means of recruiting, hearing uh, them, putting anger on them, use, use, using the dependent situation of a child, using children well, not only as a soldiers, but also as the auxiliary personnel, the one who helps to bring weapon systems, brings food, and so on. The next category of children we are dealing with is uh, the, the occupation and sizing of uh, high, of a step of educational establishments where children were. And this is very popular because the troops are being uh, allocated in, uh, in, in schools, taking into account that nobody will shoot at schools. But the war, it's not like that. That we have a hope that the missile will not land at some of the areas. And here is a threat that simply military, enemy, enemy military will be shooting at our military and they will just as a stray bullet will hit at the will hit at the sh at the shelters of educational establishments. The next category is the involvement of field children to equip the military objects. Basically, children labor used to build up military facilities and objects. And there is another threat for children that they can be either killed or wounded by the fire of another side of the conflict, because in there is a threat on military objects that there will be a constant challenge landing there. The next one is the killing of children. In the video that you saw, you saw this very girl, she's from Mariupol, and uh, the doctors were trying to, to, to rescue her, but they failed. And this kind of kids in Mariupol, there were tons of them. And there was a, one memoirs of uh, a doctor. He said that when Mariupol was seized, and the buildings were bombarded. I came to one of the buildings, there was a lady standing, and uh, down there, there was a little carpet and a body underneath it. And when me as a doctor came closer, this lady opened up this carpet for me and said that this is my child. And this doctor said, I did not find any proper words with which I could support her because I simply cannot know the words one can support somebody in this, in this very situation. Also, I want to show you this picture. It's a small cemetery in one of the towns of our state. And you can see how many, how many children bodies are here in black, in black plastic bags. For us, it's that has already become a norm. Next one is the kidnapping of children and bringing them outside of Ukraine for on the premises of our countries or country. 
As the day before yesterday, seven more kids were returned back to Ukraine from aggressor state. Seven more people who were, by means of force, brought to another state. It's not a practice of only this war. This is a very widely spread practice of war. But in this case, these are our children, and they have rights to live with their families in their, on their land. And unfortunately, we have experience when, when we have people for whom this is a norm to steal somebody's children. And uh, a question I, I have, did these people have their, their own mothers? And also we have Ukrainian ombudsman, Dmitry Lubinets, who's been saying that we are doing everything possible to bring our kids back. But he's saying officially that not that many countries are helping us to bring our children back. The last seven kids that were brought to Ukraine the day before yesterday, it was brought by Qatar. Qatar is, is doing a, a lot to bring our kids back. But, the, but there is not that much state that help us to do that. The same, we would like to thank UNICEF structure that has all, also been involved so much into returning our kids back to Ukraine, to their families. And now I'd like to offer to show you our Ukrainian school of child and adolescent psychotherapy that due to our huge staff of Ukrainian um, Association of Psychotherapists. We managed to open it all up based on our 20 years experience and based on this very model that I learned from Vera. And we simply adopted these to Ukrainian realities. And the year, the, we have had 20 years of experience and more than 20 projects all over Ukraine where we teach Ukrainian psychotherapists and we have our cells in many regions of Ukraine. And within our education, the whole Ukraine has been covered. And next one, I will show you the way we do it. We, we have designed our own methodology where we involved the 10 years war experience in Ukraine. But indeed, it's been 10 years of war in Ukraine and we have been dealing with this children for 10 years. And this is active involvement of these children and active involvement of our feelings with them. And both we, we have dealing with uh, aviation catastrophes and disasters that we had and we have been working with during many years ahead. And during the last two years of full-scale invasion in Ukraine, that is why we created our own model based on our own experience. And I'd like to show you just a little bit. Here we have a methodology of Ukrainian Children and uh, Adult Psychotherapy 2024 has been published. This is experience of work in those 14 projects. We, 14 educational projects. We have been describing them. We have been describing the cases of those projects. And based on those re reflections and hundreds of psychotherapists and their reflections and their cases on hundreds of supervisions, we have designed intervention model of child child psychotherapy and since and uh, vira and patricia were so much right that saying that uh, child and children psychotherapy has been oriented to resources we have to basically rely on positive experience and to provide and while thinking this very good experience provide perspectives for the child to develop because this is the only chance for a child to develop to move forward and to be a constructive human being in the society they are in. This model incorporates interventions through certain regressive psychotechniques up to the prenatal development state, development of the fetus, where we get down in order to find resources. Right now we have clients, kids who were brought from the occupied zones and they have this symptom, they just cannot swallow. It's not anorexia, uh, they did not deny eating, no, but they just can't swallow even water. That's a great threat of, uh, you know, death of the kid 
in the matter of days, let alone weeks. And when we have such children's experience, we understand that through this background, they get into the deep prenatal reg regress when they can't swallow. So we have to help them get initial resources through which they can have this safety where they will be able to um, have this body symptom. Yes, kids, they react with their body. They cannot describe their condition. But this helps us, you know, to get these uh, kids out of the regress condition through this feeling of safety and resources uh, during their initial phases of development. Then we try to upgrade them to the another phases, looking for resources up till today, accumulating like beads on a necklace, these resources on every stage of development to enable them to function with the experience they have, even though it's sometimes it's unconceivable because children do not want to live with this experience. Uh, this is traumatic, massively traumatic experience. And maybe this is experience that was not experienced during the previous war. Structure of preparation. Let's have a look how we prepare our child uh, therapists. It's a five-year educational project with 640 hours. It's like 21 class or sessions, which includes uh, the full scope of the personal experience. The second block is theoretical training, around 600 hours. There we have certain theories and um, propedeutics. This is the children's psychiatric uh, propedeutics as well. Also, we have independent psychotherapeutical practice, individual psychotherapy. We also have the exams that they have to pass. This education actually incorporates uh, seven, eight years because child therapist works not only with the kid, but with the whole system. And also we have certain additional projects within the framework of our school that are obligatory for uh, child therapists. We have the sub projects. Uh, the, we deal with the basic sand play therapy, the work of child psychologists and psychotherapists. Uh, we also work with the neurotic disorders in children and we pay attention to the psychodiagnostics of different age categories. We have theoretical sub-project, psychotherapy and culture. It actually uh, is based on the children's disorders. It's important because that is what our reality reflects right now. So where uh, do we work and where our centers operate? I mean, in respect of people who graduated from our courses. We have main cities, Cape Vivni, Pro Ujhara, Ternopa, Rivne, Poltava, Odessa. Basically, that central part of Ukraine, western and southern part of Ukraine. And actually, they disseminate the knowledge received to other districts and regions of Ukraine. Then uh, we have certain reports of our centers for 2024. What do we do within the context of war? Let's start, start with the key, with our capital. They have elaborated their curriculum that is called Children and Adolescents During the War, Experience of Psychological Assistance. There are also designed uh, webinars and um, workshops for parents. Called The project is called Confidence Together, Your Support is Near. Also, we have... The project for children's psychiatric propedeutics. We have online workshop on PTSD and also to give the urgent psychological assistance to the victims of war. As for the Rivno city, it's a big city, big oblast and region. There are lots, but there's great endeavors of the child psychotherapists. We provide 
initial primary psycho psychological help and psychotherapy. Rimna actually that's the region where a lot of IDPs and refugees fled. We understand that, of course, the biggest number of refugees are accumulated in the western part of Ukraine. Therefore, we tried to focus our work with the IDPs who live in different conditions. We have modular cities where IDPs and refugees live in small blocks. Uh, they live by families. Uh, right now, I actually thought of, uh, that I should have found the photo of such modular uh, villages. These are like blocks, 20 square meters, and families live in these blocks. These uh, blocks are located in parks, uh, in uh, cities, outside the cities. So in Rimne, the support is provided to the children who came from the eastern part of Ukraine, uh, from the occupied or semi-occupied cities. It's Volnovakha, Severodonetsk, Irpinsk, Kharkiv. Also, it is about the multidisciplinary mobile team, which is uh, which operates under by support of UNICEF, and there is also the psychological support to IDPs and local residents. It is provided on the individual basis and on on the group work basis. We work with the kids under eighteen. There are focus groups for teenagers, uh, of IDP teenagers. We also have a project that is aimed at uh, capacity building. It is called Kids and the War. We teach them of the healing techniques. Uh, other programs called Parenting Without Stress, Developing the Educational Potential of Parents and Persons Who Replace Them in Times of Uncertainty. People do not know whether they are going to live tomorrow. They are afraid of different strikes. And again, it's ongoing for two years. A lot of support we, receive, we provide to adolescents so that they can be capable to develop the possible future perspective because the level of suicide has increased during war and this is the category of children who is the most vulnerable because of the of being displaced we have never encountered such a phenomenon we have never asked uh, this question teenagers they live in the separation condition far from their families and of course they are, they are not willing to live this way and they lose their sense of perspective. And very often they perceive this as violence against them. So if children before teenage, teen, teenage period, uh, they feel themselves protected by parents, then teenagers, they want to be with their peers, but they have been separated. And then I will talk about the project that we initiated here in Lviv um, on the occupied territories and how we reunited teenagers who live abroad. Some of them are refugees, some of them live on the occupational territories, but they are peers from the same class, from the same street. So how did we manage to give them this chance to be reunited? It's vital for them to be reunited again. Uh, the teenager who were deported, sometimes they have this protest position. They don't want to go to school in the country they are in. They want to go back home. And we have never thought about it because, again, that's something typical for the teenager. They are rebels, but they manifest this rebellious behavior in this way while being abroad. We also have some reports from Dnipro center. Uh, Dnipro is a big city in the central eastern part of Ukraine. I welcome our colleagues who joined from Dnipro. We know that Dnipro is a target city for Russia. 
But they work very hard, and we have psychologists from NIPRO working in our supervisional group. Some of them live in European countries working from there. They provide support to kids living in different countries. It's pretty characteristic about uh, NIPRO people because a lot of psychologists uh, migrated during the first days of the war because the uh, region was shelled heavily. Have a look at the report from Poltava. Poltava, again, is very close to the combat area. It's a specific region. It's, it's really different from Lviv region. So Poltava people make great endeavor. They cooperate with UNICEF. I appreciate US, the efforts by UNICEF. They organize work with children all over Ukraine. So basically, they have developed the project called Body Stabilization and Resource, aimed at people who undergone loss. Also, we have a program for professionals who work with IDPs with, uh, for kids and the children. Also, we have the project Energy of, of, for the Family, the Future of the Child. So despite all of that, we have the future perspective. We're not know what the future will bring us but of course we are waiting for this future to come uh, let's talk about the report from Viv center this is my native region my native center along with the Ujhorod center that i will present i would like to tell you that today we had a big international conference and i would like to say thank you to the austrian union of psychotherapists and uh, vienna institute thanks to our colleagues who helped us organize such a big international conference to represent our efforts all over the world. We collected a lot of prof SMEs working in different um, EU countries, working with IG IDPs, etc., and refugees. Uh, we had supervisors who were willing to see, to uh, showcase different cases, because we have a lot of difficulties and sometimes we do not see the full picture so we feel dissociation because we try to protect ourselves from the everyday suffering we have everyday losses i have two losses in my family in my uh, this my in my big family so i know that we cannot show our feelings yeah we have to stay to keep we have to keep up we also have colleagues from different cities who came here in order to help us. Uh, Malta uh, service does a lot. Caritas and other organizations from other countries of the world, they do a lot. They make great deeds. One talking about Khmelnytsky Center, they have been constantly bombarded. And I would like to say that last year I went there to be a supervisor and actually I was in the midst of shelling. It was a massive one and uh, I had to finish this project for all that. So we have new project for the whole Ukraine about the translating of their uh, experience on the neurotic disorder in children and adolescents in the work of child psychologists. We take part in international conference, in workshops in different parts of Ukraine. We share our experience and gain new one. It's very important, not only for us. And uh, I would like to stop here on uh, Transcarpathian Center. It's around Czech, it's like, it adjacent countries of which are Czech Republic and Hungary. This region actually did a lion's share of work uh, when it comes to organizing of this international organization. Uh, it looks like, you know, our kids were disseminated, right, all over the world, but we didn't let them go. They are our children, and our heart is always with our children. So we try to help them as much as we can. We cooperate. Uh, and help parents integrate in the world. We also have another experience of the Ternopil Center. There is a project 
There is a project of Sand Play Therapy. We cooperate with our European partners and colleagues. We provide education on a good level because right now we say that Sand Play it's really works well. It's something that we it's something that we have found out for us. Uh, again, it, the results are very good. People feel safe. Kids feel safe, and they feel their resources. Also, we have hotlines where consultations have been provided via phone. We also have Children of the War program. In uh, Lviv Hospital, we had kids who were brought from eastern parts of Ukraine with a certain experience of violence, conflict-related violence, and our doctors have been sent further, so basically, uh, Lviv was a hub, you know, a transition point for such refugees. And then these kids were sent to European countries to have rehabilitation and treatment. And I appreciate the efforts of our international colleagues. And right now I would like to present you the Crisis Ecological Counseling Center for Kids. Uh, we had two centers in Lviv. The first one was at the railway station, where uh, thousands of people have been going through daily and there the first crisis psychological support was provided to the all layers of life or from people for people from all walks of life so basically this center operates near our university there is a church uh, by Clementi Sheptitsky his brother Andrei Sheptitsky, he was the Metropolitan appointed by Franz Joseph when we were a part of Austro-Hungarian Empire. Then he continued his service when we were part of Poland at the beginning of 20th century. And then the Andrei Sheptitsky, he was a great foundator during the Second World War he actually bought Jewish families, Jewish feeds, by, by means of funds, by money, and they kept him here in Lviv region. That was the person who built a lot of shelters, orphanages, during World War II. He also built hospitals, clinics, schools for such kids. So this church with the museum of Andrei Sheptitsky, you can see the picture, that's him. And this church gave us the possibility to create this center. It's uh, noteworthy that here the concerts are done, performed by our musicians, by our singers, and people who came from all corners of Ukraine who were puzzled at first, they felt this existential damage to themselves. They had this possibility, you know, to um, recover by means of musical therapy. Here we had the group therapy. I would like to show you the pictures here. We had individual therapy. Here you can see the photo of those Jewish orphanages who were saved by Andrei Sheptitsky back then. So you see this puzzle and this whole multi-layered picture right now is visible because we see how it's important to support kids during war in different periods. These are our students volunteers. So they had the first volunteering experience this crisis center. Here we see uh, James Gordon to host the workshop. We have here Alexander Marononko uh, along here. We had this workshop on traumas. We also, our colleagues from the US, they shared their experience. It was just the beginning of war, but they had experience uh, in working with the victims of war in different regions. So we shared our experience. And here, uh, this very interesting couple is a pregnant, uh, woman this is her kid and you see that teenager you see that this teenage daughter had panic attacks so this mom turned to us with this daughter 
and we see we have here the sand uh, box so we help this daughter and the mom to have this safety space here within the center and there are lots of different directions of safety it's not just about therapy it's also about spirituality because for someone this is a great foundation i mean in terms of religion For some people, music all is all a healing as well. integrated the society into the society, different spaces into one. And each human being who came to us and asked us the first support, because all in all, one had to be provided the first aid, basically to satisfy the basic physical needs of a human being, basically to cover with somebody, to provide hot tea, to give something, to eat, to ask whether this human being needs something else, to give this human being a chance to sleep. So sometimes, basically, people used to come come by our by us and basically to lean on us. They simply had to physically feel this connection with with us because we did not feel what they felt while being there back back there in the east. And for that, there was another resource. So we integrated completely different forms of uh, help because each human being will in on the level of intuition, will pick up whatever he or she needs first. So this very slide, during two years, we had two international conferences. And what is more important is that this very conference in 2022, it was uh, offered by us even before the full-scale invasion started. That was the 9th of February, the full-scale invasion started on the 24th, and we offered our Ukrainian uh name how to how to live in a world where adults went crazy and the people were like uh, wondering like helena why is this name so provocative i was asking like in return okay let us think why did this very thought occurred into the mind of our psychotherapist and in two, in two weeks time the war started and this was such, such, a, such a magical intuition i cannot explain because this is definitely not the title that came to my mind this is a title that we collectively, together with our uh, staff uh, of si children's psychotherapies, picked up. And it was precisely the title about this very primary experience during the first months of war. This conference it itself took place in May. And uh, by that time, we have already assembled four months of work with children in the basements, in the shelters, where psychotherapists were living for months. And every time... Every day we were basically connecting to them with the online, like literally every day. And for the first two weeks, two months, I was connecting with them every day, but then I asked for some kind of rotation because I was going through burnout. And my colleagues kept on this path, and uh, with the whole team, we have been working in this very mode. And we have always been asking like them, who, who is feeling some kind of burnout? And immediately we were su superseding to each other, we were supporting to each other, to other to our psychotherapists who've been living for weeks in those basements and shelters together with children. What I will also like to mention about this very situation. In our university, there is designed the whole program of ecologically ecological survey of children who went through raping, tortures, or were the witnesses of raping or tortures. This is a specially designed program, and since we have been working with these children for a long time, we know that many children do not talk and do not tell us these things. Not because they do not want to, but because this kind of uh, Brock center is being blocked in their mind. They simply basically step out from those emotional areas, and we have to look for any other nonverbal means of interviewing that these children, so, so that for them not even to understand that we are doing some kind of research intervention, so that first to help them, and secondly, to assemble some materials of those crimes that they went through. And to wrap up, I would like to show you the project that we started and it was quite uh, we, we had some fear to start it here i will not mention 
what town or city it was right now. It, it is occupied, unfortunately. But this is very close one to the Dnipro River. And one of the leaders of these uh, of these uh, towns came to us who was a refugee in Lviv, and he told us that children there in this occupied town demand a huge amount of support. And he told us what was going on there, what events were occur occurring there. And you know, he, he said he said that a part of people moved out, but a part of them stayed with children. And these children want to see each other. Is it possible somehow for you to help us? Somehow to to allow those children to see their peers because this is their resource. And back then, we together with our uh, psychotherapist did a group, and we said, okay, let us at least try. Obviously, this is an online project. We have no idea what is the state and condition of all those children there. We cannot do any diagnosis of any child there. But we have at least the idea of unite them somehow, because for them, that's extremely important. This is their resource. And you know, we did this program. We launched it. Me and my colleague, Mariana Narchikova, we were the supervisors of this project. And we were going online almost every day, they were created 14 groups for children of different ages who primarily were at the very beginning were living in one town, going to the same schools, were going attending post school activities. A part of them moved out of Ukraine, a part of them were in Ukraine but on those non-occupied territories, and a part of them was there on the occupied territories. And at the very beginning, we had to somehow basically to relieve a, an anxiety from our psychotherapists to begin those online groups, those online support groups. We call this uh, online resource support groups of children. And what is important is that we managed to do that. It had a success. And this project had been uh, working for half a year. And those children who were there occupied in the occupied areas, they were scared to go online even though they did, but they were really scared to do that. And they articulated why. I will not tell you why, but perhaps you all can guess it. But they were online. And for those students, those groups were so much extremely important and something that they really needed. So take a look at this picture, how beautiful the Dnipro is, how beautiful our cities are, how beautiful our views are. Unfortunately, part of them right now is occupied. However, children were basically meeting each other in those groups. All those tasks that the psychotherapists were doing, we were picking them very precisely, so not to touch any kind of strings or those deep, deep feelings of children. But they were designed simply to provide them with a resource to deal with the situations they are in right now. And in the same way, we had meetings with their parents, because at the same time we had to, to provide the meetings to parents, because this is a system we designed that should be reimbursed on equal level, and we managed to do that. And now I have this wheel, I know I'm pressing time, because due to the fact that we are overloaded with work, please do at least a publication of this project. We have it, we have it completely described, we have all the tasks described, we can, we can share the experience of our colleagues, and perhaps for those colleagues that will might have this kind of situation in which they will be able to use our experience. We will be more than happy to help you with that. But I need just a little bit more time to do this publication. What I described here is the, basically the architecture of our project I told you about right now. These are 14 groups for children, designed for children and one group for parents. These are the tasks only designed to support the resource and to support the kids. Next, what we had is a presentation gave us three stages of supervisory support to psychotherapists who were working with these children and what reflections psychotherapists came to supervision sessions. These are also the experience we can share. And I think the dynamics in these various groups will be very equal in any um, in any area of the way of the world where the hot phase of the war is going on. So what we also used is that we published these monographies based on this experience, the existence of fear and life in uh, modern reality, the palliative and hospice care, psychological assistance to refugees in wartime, and the psychology of individuality that we published during wartime. And I'm 
we did not know what to put there on the very front title, but the intuition worked here. But by that time, we have been working in uh, in the war conditions for eight years, but it was touching us not that much severely. And I would like to wrap it all up with the following generalization. But just take a look at these kids with the with the armored vehicle on the background. The kids who are basically holding in their arms the bottles of water. They do not have food, and this is the life they have right now. And this is the sense of life that they have right now. And this is also a resource, even a small one, but the one that we so much need. We needed so much from you all, at least just bit by bit. Just just a support and a resource, nothing more. And this is a sip of water that will give hope and that will give life. And what I would like to mention here too is that about those unbreakable, our little Ukrainians. Let me tell you a story of this very kid. He's eight years old. He's, his name is Roman. His father, he was the director of the Academy of Musical Academy in Lviv. And his wife is in Vinnytsia. And last year, he went with his boy into polyclinic, into hospital, just for regular search to a children doctor. And at that time, a missile landed on the premises of the hospital. So when the boy came back to consciousness, nobody basically found him under those ruins. When he came back to consciousness, he saw his mother under a huge plate, concrete plate, and underneath the plate there was only her hair. And he basically touched her by her hair. He basically gave her a farewell. He got up and uh, approximately 45% of his skin and body is being burned. So he did a couple of steps and he sat on a stone. And the stone had such a temperature that he basically burned all his uh, buttocks. But he couldn't do by that time more than a couple of steps, steps in a row. And when he came out, those people who saw him, they could not even believe what they saw. The whole body of a child was black from burnouts. He was brought to Lviv. And in Lviv, the parents were completely uh, on the edge. And they somehow communicated to German doctors, asking whether they can uh, turn, they can bring him to Germany. And by that time, they did not believes that he will make it to Germany, but he had made, made it to Germany, thanks to German doctors. And right now, let me just eat, to enlarge this picture just a little bit for you to, to see how he, what kind of healing he went through. He has such a willpower to life. And I, I, I just want you to take a look at his hands and his face and, and his, his hands precisely. Yeah, it's, if you can see it. And just, just trust me, I'm so nervous from now. So he's completely, his body is completely burned out. Back in his day, he had the iron mask he was wearing. Now we are designing plastic ones for our children. And he's dancing. Yes, it's hard for him. He will be going through, he's already gone through dozens of surgeons and surgeries. And dozens of surgeries are lying ahead of him. But he's dancing, dancing. He's playing because he he's playing musical instruments. And in this way, he said that my fingers have to basically work because there should be something between my fingers and the musical instruments because otherwise I will not be able to process my hands. And these are our unbreakable children. And perhaps at this very note, I would like to thank you all. And I would like to show you these beautiful children eyes you can see right now. And I'd like to thank you again for the possibility to have this speech right now. I wish you all to have a peace. My dear Helena, I hardly know how to find the words to respond to what you have presented to us. You have opened our emotions and our hearts and our eyes to the tragedies that are happening to children in your country. You have opened up our emotions and our eyes 
to all the work that's going on, all the, all the psychotherapeutic work, all the initiatives, all the training, all the things that are happening. Um, and I'm really conscious how many comments you were getting from people who are listening. You've touched everyone's hearts today in, in the words that you've said and the ways in which you've helped us to see the impact of the war on children's lives, but also see the work that you and your colleagues are doing. Helena, I would like to ask you, you mentioned that you were near burnout at one point. How, what is the impact on you of all the work that you are doing? I feel, I feel compassion for you. Well, first, I'd like to thank you much for you because we have supervisory groups that not only for me, but also for my for our staff personnel is done by our Austrian colleagues. Every two weeks we have supervisory groups and I'm so grateful for them. And indeed, Austria for me is a special country. Vera, we have, we have Vera right now with us. She's always been a pretty good resource for me. And to these days, we also have supervisory groups. That's another resource. Obviously, there is this ecology of basically treating yourself. That's how we as, as psychotherapists are dealing with. When we are burning out, we are basically speaking up about this. We are supporting each other. And then each of us is following his or her own resources and giving these resources, giving this link to another psychotherapist as well to children and their, and their um, colleagues. In Ukraine now, we have many good and decent children psychotherapists. So I would like to express my gratitude to this association of Ukrainian psychotherapists. And indeed, that's a special unity, that's a special union. I think not only them, I think to European Union too. And I would like also to mention that what is also very much helping is Polish state, Polish side. Because sometimes they help me to come to them to university and to do reports not only during conferences but also to allow me to recreate a little bit and they create these conditions for me so thanks so much for european union for all these countries you are impeccable in your efforts and you are the ones not giving us the chance to burn out thank you for the support mm. Mm. well i'm i'm pleased to hear the support that you receive because it is only when we stand together and support each other that we can face these this kind of work this the impact that it has on us so i'm pleased indeed and also you embody the spirit of ukraine at this time i wrote down the words that you said about roman the little boy who had been so badly burned you, on the screen it said in english he has not given up as has not the entire Ukrainian people. And that is so true. You, you, you carry yourselves with hope, with dignity, with so much courage during this war. And I and, so, and my colleagues have so much admiration for you. So I send my love to you and thank you so much for everything you have given us this morning in the presentation. It's been a great honor to have you as part of our symposium today. Thank you very much, Alina. Thank you.